It was really fun to connect with people and hear how people felt about our show. We had so much positive feedback from folks who just loved seeing our lifestyle and really felt like they were learning from us. And so many people actually would tell us that they changed their lifestyle to seek out uh, something a little more similar to what we were doing. Hello, welcome to Discovering the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Roxanne McLeod, along with my good friend, Lainey Janke. We are super excited to announce today in our episode, we have our good friend joining us from Homer, Alaska. But before we have our guests join us, Ms. Lainey, how are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. Thanks for asking, Rox. It's really great to see you. I'm so happy to be here on this podcast. Um, it's been interesting leading up to the podcast. I've been so excited. And um, at work, I'm a psychotherapist. And um, I have to say, this podcast has been on my mind with a lot of excitement. So I'm ready to dive in. All right. You're good. All right. Today's re guest requires no introduction for the fans of the reality hit TV show, Alaska, The Last Frontier. Please welcome the classy, generous, kind, sweet, all doing everything gal, Miss Charlotte Kilcher. Welcome, Charlotte. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks for the nice welcome. I'm good. Um, I've been just trying to survive some really cold temperatures this winter. It's been... Um, a really crazy last 10 days or so. And we just got a warm up. But before that, um, it was just below zero temperatures every day and struggling to make sure the animals were all fed and taken care of and um, that the animals would survive. And at one point, um, I was bringing a lot of animals into the house. And um, <laughs> Otto was none too pleased about that oh, because... I have these little these little chickens. They're called ceramas, and it's the tiniest breed of chicken that there is. So they don't have much body um, bulk on them. So they they really can't survive cold temperatures as well as a regular chicken. So um, and then they also can freeze their combs. And even though I have a heat lamp in my chicken coop. Uh, my peacocks hog the heat lamp. And so those tiny chickens, I'm always afraid they're not going to stay warm enough. So I had a kennel of like eight tiny chickens in the house and then a separate kennel of an, a separate rooster. And um, so with the roosters crowing and um, the smell of the chickens, Otto was complaining. And I said, it's a farm, <laughs> but he didn't really want the farm in the kitchen and the bathroom. So anyway, we're over that now. The chickens all survived. All the critters survived. But um, it was definitely a rough patch in the winter having that, that uh, long, cold snap. I bet. Um, we've been fortunate in Minnesota, as you know. I've had an unseasonably warm winter, which has been nice for Troy and Laney because they actually heat their home with wood all winter long, which, as you know, is a lot of work. So, Lainey, mm -hmm. I bet that was a nice little reprieve from last winter. Oh, absolutely. It's a love-hate relationship with that thing that sits outside that you just pitch <laughs> wood into. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, Lainey, so uh, you got to give me the lowdown. Otto keeps wanting to do that at our house. He wants the outside thing. Yeah. And then I'm like, I just want the stove in the house. I don't have to go outside. And he's like, no, then all the mess is outside. And so he's always arguing with me that we should put that kind of a system in. And I just want the stove in the house. So <laughs> how do you like that? The outside boiler is actually pretty, pretty slick. All you got to do is throw it. It's just like going out to feed the chickens or the animals. You just feed the, the wood boiler and it's an awesome source of heat. We're it sounds like you're a proponent of this. Yes. I, Even though it can be a little exhausting sometimes, right? As you know, when you heat with wood, you have to be there during the day. Somebody's got to be there to do the work, but it's, it's, it's very, um, it's very rewarding in the end. So, well, but we haven't had to burn as much wood this year uh -huh. because of the warm temperatures, which is great. Um, and how about you? You do, do you burn with wood right now inside? 
Yeah, so we do heat with wood. And so, you know, there is still all of that work. And somehow I just felt like having the stove somewhere else where you would actually have to go outside and deal with it just seemed like an extra step. But maybe it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Actually, the wood stays outside. Mm -hmm. If you think of it, the extra step could be bringing the wood in the house. But it's it's kind of how you like it. Um, We'll see if if Otto gets his way, right, Charlotte? (laughs) I don't know. Well, hearing your side, um, it's making me think again. And we have so much dust in our house from using wood and the, the, you know, wood smoke and everything being in the house. And so I'm constantly either dusting or thinking, geez, I need to dust. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. um, or not dusting and feeling like it's out of control. So, mm-hmm. so maybe that's something we need to do. Well, we'd be very willing to help with any kind of intelligence to feed your mind about how to work it. We've had a wood boiler in two of our homes in Minnesota, and it's, it's been a really nice thing. For the oh, most nice. part. Oh, well, I can tell that um, your uh, auto is going to be on your side now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, goodness. Right. So just tell me, in. I have one question. Do you help chop the wood or anything like that, Charlotte, or haul it or go out and harvest it? What do you all do? So honestly, uh, I chop kindling with a mm-hmm. small mm-hmm. axe, but... I can't chop the big, huge rounds. I simply don't have the muscle power. I used to, and I hate to say it, but it's just too much work. It's and so work. I do go out and uh, when mostly it's Otto and August, we'll go together to get firewood. And so when they go cut up a tree, I'll go with them and I'll, I'll um, you know, I'll help load it up into a trailer or whatever we were hauling around to load it up in. And I haul it from the woodshed into the house or I stack wood. I'll, I'll do that. But I really can't, you know, just the, um, the ax or the mall or whatever it is that, um, Otto uses to chop wood. The thing is so heavy. I swear it's hard for me to just even get it up over my shoulders and slam it down, let alone repeat that a bunch of times, you know? I mean, I could probably do Absolutely. two or three swings and I'd be done. <laughs> so um, Me too. A, a lot of times we'll use a, a, lo- a wood splitter, log splitter, and that's that automatic thing that splits the logs. But Otto actually loves chopping wood for some reason, and so we usually don't use the wood splitter, and he ends up chopping it. August likes to do it too, so the two guys oh. kind of keep us in split wood. (laughs) That's great. And of course, Mm -hmm. I I have to say, Charlotte, of course, you would have a hand in doing that, going out there and harvesting the wood in the way that you can contribute. I think that's just Mm -hmm. part of your spirit. It's it's kind (laughs) of how I felt like since we've met you, you're we're a bit of kindred spirits in that way. Work hard, play hard, love hard, and um, just be with your family. And and, uh, I'm not surprised whatsoever. So. Oh, and I also, I, I got myself a small chainsaw because the guy's chainsaws, again, I can barely lift the dang thing, you know, so Mm -hmm. to hold it in one hand and actually cut a log with the size of a chainsaw that they use, I just don't have the muscle power. So I got frustrated um, and got myself like a really small chainsaw. And so I can actually chainsaw wood and it's not as, it's nowhere near the the muscle action that it takes to lift that, um, you know, the splitting malls. Um, So I'm, I'm capable of doing that. But then when it comes to bigger trees, I'm still scared with the process. I don't like felling trees. Um, the whole thing just seems, unless it's really small. Um, and then I'm fine um, with chainsawing smaller logs. But once you sort of get to the point of getting the the whole chain like embedded in the log, then I just feel like, oh, something's going to go wrong. Um, and so yeah. I can have my limits. Absolutely. a story. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like it's a lot of work and I know how much work it is. Um, and I, like you, Charlotte, I am not strong enough to to throw an ax or cut wood. I can stack and help, but I'm sure it's a lot of work. So. All right. Switching gears here a little bit, Charlotte, as you know, to th- in order to thrive in Alaska, it's kind of necessary to own a boat. 
Well, oh, for yeah. those folks that follow us on Bear Cove Retreat, our social media sites, you probably know that our boat is named the Bohemian Queen. And some folks out there might think, well, how the heck did you come up with that name? It's quite unique. So I'll tell you the story. When our husbands bought the boat a few years ago, they were trying to figure out a way to name the boat after Lainey and I. Traditions go that if you name the boat after your love, that they will help protect you when your vessel and you are out to sea. Plus, I think they were just trying to get a few brownie points. <laughs> so some, something that Lainey and I have in common is we are both from Bohemian descent. So that's the Bohemian queen. That is so cool. Yeah, when I met you guys and uh, found out that your boat was named the Bohemian Queen, <laughs> that started quite the conversation between us because I love the name. Um, and so I was a little bit confused about what exactly Bohemian means. You know, when, you, uh, when we were talking about um, a boat and that you guys were Bohemian, um, and so there's a couple of definitions for Bohemian, one that you guys are actually of Bohemian descent and that it's um, that Czechoslovakia used to be called Bohemia. That was, it was most of it was the country of Bohemia and then became Czechoslovakia. And so then somewhere along the line, the um, definition for somebody who's um, just kind of a uh, a free spirit living their life um, sort of outside of the box mm -hmm. became a bohemian, you know, and usually if you were um, in the arts and artist or poet or actor or something, then those people were categorized as bohemians. And so I wasn't quite sure what um, exactly the origin of like the bohemian lifestyle was and i've always been super attracted to what they call like boho you know, the decoration style mm -hmm. and stuff i just love all the color and um i don't know just the craziness of it it's just super um engaging and fun it's, it's a fun style and so mm -hmm. anyway it was just really interesting to find out sort of the two definitions of bohemian and, um and I don't, that we're all in the same boat <laughs> well said yeah, we are we absolutely are oh <laughs> well, anyway and then that. i ended up um just kind of a funny side note um I ended up getting this school bus this old school bus that was really quite funky but it had um some definite potential. And there were a lot of um, kind of built-in features for it to be a camper. So it was already fixed up like a camper, but in a very funky way. And so last year, I worked quite a bit on making this into what I was calling my Bohemian bus, because it's got a lot of just really colorful um, Bohemian type, uh, I guess, decoration styles going on in it. Um, and so now I've I've got my my Bohemian bus, and when you guys come on over to the Homer side, you'll have to stay in my bus. <laughs> that, would be fabulous. Wait, that would be super fun. Yeah, we absolutely well, at least, take you up on that. We'll at least have to have a glass of wine in the bus. I suppose <laughs> that would be just great. I yeah. guess rest your arm, <laughs> twist our arms. There it goes. I wonder if any of our listeners really know that Charlotte is an artist. Do you want to tell us all about your love for art and being an artist? Yeah. So um, for folks who have watched me on Alaska, The Last Frontier, they did feature my artwork um, quite a few times, really, you know, when I would um, paint things. And it was usually kind of a bohemian style I was painting, <laughs> by the way. But um, I painted, um, oh, Jane's really cool solarium, um, you know, her greenhouse. I helped her paint some really colorful windows and trim and everything on that. And then um, when she and I made a, a camper together, a teardrop camper, I used a lot of crazy colors to paint that. And then she had this really outrageous wallpaper that we put inside. And so it's super colorful and fun. And um, anyway, they did show me a few times um, do it. Maybe I think they even showed me doing an actual painting on the show. But um, but anyway, yeah, I've just been an artist, I think, my entire life. I don't remember 
an age where I wasn't um, doing artwork. I mean, I even remember back to kindergarten when the teacher would compliment my coloring or whatever, you know. <laughs> oh, so, that's sweet. Um, so yeah. I was encouraged by my parents and, you know, teachers and stuff to um, pursue artwork because it came easily to me. And I always just loved a lot of color. And I I do things in a really detailed way. Like my my favorite um, medium is watercolor. And I but I don't do like swishy watercolor. It's very uh, kind of meticulously done. Um, and a lot of a lot of my subjects are animals. I do a lot of, uh, um, and I'd say that my style is a little bit um, like an illustrator style. You would be illustrating a book or um, oh, something like that. It's hard to describe, but uh, lots of color. My favorite thing is just um, putting tons of patterns and colors in something like if I'm going to have a, um, maybe animals in a living room, it'd be, it's a little bit, some of my stuff is kind of humorous like that. And so mm -hmm. then they would have like clashing uh, wallpaper with clashing rugs, with clashing uh, fabric on the chairs, with clashing outfits. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just it. try to put as much color and pattern into things as possible. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of fun being an artist. I feel like I can express my love for color and fun, just kind of wanting to present something, I guess, uh, you know, cheerful and fun to look at. So yeah, I and then I feel like also, um, along the way, I felt like being an artist was, um, I guess, since it came easily to me, then I felt like it wasn't something I wanted to pursue in college, or you know, it, I needed to do something more serious. Mm -hmm. And so I became a biologist and um, that was a lot harder. <laughs> I actually had to study really hard. <laughs> and a lot more and, serious. <laughs> but I guess I felt like somewhere along the line, you you get that message of, you know, like you need to work for these things. You can't just do something <laughs> that's easy. Well, and then also just like, oh, you want to be an artist? You know, like, um, so I pursued a college degree um, in biology. Um, and I also loved that. I really loved that, even if it was harder to take things like chemistry. <laughs> and uh, bless your heart. Um, but I I really uh, enjoy learning about. Again, I'm really interested in animals. Um, the biology that I've pursued. I I I was most interested in ornithology and ended up um, doing bird studies. I worked for Fish and Wildlife Service when I first came to Alaska and studied seabirds. Um, and then I've done some other, worked for some other consulting firms and whatnot, studying seabirds. And and so uh, animals have always been a passion. And um, that's that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I admire and respect artists, for one thing, because I cannot draw a stick figure. <laughs> so I really always appreciate folks and people that can do it. I hear another passion is flowers and it happens to be my favorite flower, the peony mm -hmm. or peony. How do you say it? And tell us about it. One of our sponsors today is Story Film Productions. Would you like some assistance filming a podcast or starting a YouTube channel? Maybe you're looking for someone to help create a commercial for your business, product, or service. Story Film Productions can help. This Minnesota-based company can help you tell your story in an impactful way through the art of videography. Visit www.storyfilmproductions.com to set up a free consultation to discuss your video or editing needs. The peony or peony, how do you say it? And tell us about it. Yeah, I say peony. So, peony. Um, but I think peony is also a pronunciation. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I grow peonies um, and I've probably grown them for about 15 years now. And I got into them thinking that it would be just kind of a fun thing to be a flower farmer. And Otto has all of his hay and cows and stuff. And so I wanted to do something that seemed more Charlotte centric, I guess, besides my vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. And so I got into peonies and I planted about 400 plants and I wanted to keep my 
field down to a level that I could just work with and not really have to hire people to help me. And so I thought maybe that would be kind of a manageable amount. Some of the farms in Homer have um, like 10,000 plants or even more than that, 15,000 plants. And so people with that many plants have to hire help. And so I just didn't want to feel like I had to rely on that. But it turns out that as many plants as I have, a lot of the the um, types of flowers that I planted weren't that good for selling or um, maybe the buds were kind of funky or, or whatever. And so a lot of them didn't really pan out as far as being really good flowers. And so I probably have about 200 plants that I really focus on that are good for selling. And, um, and even with 200 flowers, it is so much work. And so the the farms that have thousands of flowers would look at me as just a hobby farmer. 200 plants is really nothing, you know, mm. but it is so much work. And it makes me glad that I didn't plant more because <laughs> it's, well, especially just during the growing season, it's just a tremendous amount of work. Um and I love them. They're so beautiful. Um, but sometimes I wonder what in the heck was I thinking? But I, <laughs> I didn't know how much was involved, really, because um, it seemed like it was a great idea at the time <laughs> and that it could be just a little retirement business or something. But it, um, it's definitely full on, you know, when it's growing and picking season, you've got to go out and check the flowers at least about three times a day, I have to walk through the field, if not more, to wow. see whether the buds are at the perfect picking point. Otherwise, if it's hot weather, especially mm -hmm. they can just pop open and then you've lost the opportunity to be able to keep that flower and ship it. Um, wow. And so uh, there's just a lot of... Um, there's so much involved that ends up really tying you down to your field. You know, you can't go take a trip or really do that much during during the the blooming season other speaking than tend to your flowers yeah tend to your flowers speaking of the blooming season this last summer when we were up in homer in july there's a lot of activities that happen and in, in homer surrounded around the peony flower i remember it was towards the end of july and the peonies were not in bloom yet because it was a late season. Was, am I remembering that right, Charlotte? You sure are. Yeah, last year was absolutely crazy. It was the latest season I had ever experienced in the 15 mm -hmm. years that I've been growing peonies. And um, my flowers, for some reason, they're really early in the Homer area. I might just have the perfect southern facing slope or... I've, I've got a lot of alders surrounding the peony patch, so there might just be a nice little concentration of heat where it is, but my flowers are really early in my, uh, my area, and they I usually get them at the end of June. I'll even have flowers um, predictably at the end oh. of June, and I didn't have them until the end of July. Everything was seriously about a month late, and so um, I'm a member of a peony co-op here in Homer called Alaska Beauty Peony Co-op. And so um, my flowers go through the co-op to be sold, usually to, uh, well, there's a lot of local sales, sales within Alaska, but there's also um, orders that come in from the um, lower 48 states. And so all of the orders were screwed up because uh, people would order ahead of time and to have the flowers a month late was just crazy right mm -hmm. yeah I remember going around town and all the different peony flowers they were just in their tight little drum themselves and, um and it was just a, a different weather for the um last summer too a different season yeah yeah, yeah. so I have a really cool my favorite peony story of mine Please. Um, <laughs> yeah so um it might have been I guess it was like three years ago. I think it was three years ago. I was approached by Rosalind and Jimmy Carter, their florist, to provide flowers for their 75th wedding anniversary. 
And um, they had watched our show. Um, there was an episode where I had my peony flowers and COVID was happening. And so there weren't a lot of weddings. You know, there was no events for people to be buying the flowers. So I had a lot of extra flowers. And I just felt like I've got the flowers and the all these people need my flowers. You know, there's funerals that people couldn't attend. There are people right. in the hospital. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who, or weddings with no flowers. And so we had an episode where um, I went down to the beach below our house and just took and buckets of flowers and um, Otto and August and Ivan and Eve and I threw them out into the ocean and had them um, wash away, um, you know, on the tide. And so it was a really beautiful episode and it touched so many people. And so the Carters and their florist actually saw that episode. So they tracked me down through the peony co-op and ordered peonies from me for their 75th oh. wedding anniversary. So I was oh, just special. freaking out to think, <laughs> Like, I I just admire them as just mm -hmm. um, such um, amazing people, just what they have done with their lives. And to think that they were watching the show or even knew who I was <laughs> and wanted my flowers. And apparently peonies are Rosalind's or they were Rosalind's mm -hmm. favorite flower. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, they got sent down to the anniversary event. And then the florist sent back all these cute little goodies from Georgia, like peach jam and, oh. um, and stuff like that. So anyway, that's, that's just awesome. my favorite peony story because it was so touching that they actually tracked me down. <laughs> oh, and then I um, I saw they had that. It was televised them uh, their event, and I saw the peony flowers when it showed them sitting. Uh, maybe somebody was giving a speech or something, but you you could see peony flowers in the at the event, and I was like, those are my flowers. <laughs> That's just so special. That's a great story, Charlotte. And one of the mm. things that makes me think of. Um, I have a master gardener in my family and my grandma was a fabulous, my grandma from Bohemia, from Czechoslovakia, but uh, uh -huh. I'll have to mention that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's no better uh, feeling as a, I would imagine, as a uh, flower grower or farmer to see somebody experience the joy of what you've harvested, what you've grown and harvested. So I imagine tenfold that experience for you with um, President Carter and Rosalind Carter was just amazing. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, um, yeah, it just made the whole thing worth so worthwhile. That's so right. All of your labor of love. It's just an amazing story. And it sounds like it truly is a labor of love. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it is a crazy racket. Flower <laughs> when any of the when you think that farming and all of it has a certain romance and, you know, thinking, oh, I just want to be a farmer or, or and a flower farmer, what could be better? Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> anyway, there are parts of it that are so wonderful. And then the other part is just the hard work. <laughs> we'll have to come check it out. I'd love to yeah. see your peonies. Mm -hmm. Yes. We when we have some wine on the bus, we'll check out the peonies. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll send we'll you some all back together. to... <laughs> I'll send you peonies back to the retreat. There you go. All right, Charlotte, let's talk about the show a little bit. Alaska, the last frontier. What would you say you enjoyed most about being on the show? Well, it was such an experience. I mean, um, just mind blowing that it even happened to us because it wasn't something we were ever seeking out. We were just found. <laughs> um, and so we never were planning to be actors or on TV or making a fuss about ourselves. We were just kind of living our lives <laughs> and living our lives uh, also sort of out of the mainstream. So um, it was really odd to be thrown into um, such the public eye as we were. Um, but I think what I really liked is once we realized that uh, it wasn't going to kill us, <laughs> It was really fun to connect with people and hear how people felt about our show. We had so much positive feedback from folks who just loved seeing our lifestyle and really felt like they were learning from us. And so many people 
actually would tell us that they changed their lifestyle to seek out uh, something a little more similar to what we were doing. And it's like that. It's like the flower farming. It sounds great, but then when you really have to do it, it's so much work. So hopefully the people who tried to make those changes are still happy about it because it is a lot of work. But um, I, so I really love the feedback from the folks that we would meet or would reach out to us uh, and tell us how much they loved the show and and how much they learned from us. So it made me feel like we were doing something more meaningful than just... Um, I'm going to just say this, a stupid reality show. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are those. Yeah. Sorry. There really are those. Um, and so I actually felt pride in what we were doing. I felt like we were sharing something really, really good with people. And of course, there are certain times that there's some crazy hype on the show or whatever, or you never know how the editors are going to edit it, or they might edit in, they might leave something in that you wish you hadn't <laughs> said or hadn't acted that way. But all in all, I think people saw so much of us that they know exactly who we are. You can't really hide it. Mm -hmm. and, and they still liked us. <laughs> so um, that's clear. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of rewarding aspects of being part of the show and we're kind of in this limbo right now where discovery has not told us that we um have been let go but we've not been picked up for so long that it seems like uh obvious that the show isn't going to happen again but they've never said it's not and so there still is the option that they will pick it up again and they've discoveries going through mergers and this and that and so maybe at some point they will pick it up again just we don't have any answers so we don't know um and if they did want to pick it up again i'm sure that we would get on board but meanwhile we're just living our lives like it's probably maybe it's over mm -hmm. um so, uh, but I also, I just feel so grateful that we've had that experience. I feel like it, it's so unique. And um, even though there were times that it was difficult, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Mm -hmm. That's, that's incredible. The, the show itself is incredible. And you know, there's many seasons and many episodes, obviously, and you have a large fan base. What would you say, I know this is probably a very difficult question, but what would you say is one of your favorite episodes? Today's sponsor, Bear Cove Retreat. Let Bear Cove Retreat be your guide as you embark upon your dream Alaskan coastal adventure. Their off-the-grid, all-inclusive retreat is the perfect option for folks seeking a journey with unique experiences in a serene setting. Visit www dot bearcoveretreat.com for more details what would you say is one of your favorite episodes well um okay <laughs> i have to say that pretty much anything that i did with jane was just usually tons of fun so i love doing episodes with yes. her because we could just kind of be crazy together and and so uh i loved doing just oh i don't know the the we did so many fun things, but I I think my actual favorite episode was um, a really wrenching episode where um, one of our cows had gotten stuck in a tidal gut. It's like a, a channel, a tidal channel up at the head of the bay, and it was stuck in the mud, and these tide channels are very narrow, so it was just the the uh, size of the cow's body it was wedged in there. And so the tide comes in and out of those guts and it would drown the cow and, and the cow was, it couldn't move. It was just stuck in there. So Mark Moret had been up there and he found the cow. So he let me know that the cow was in this situation and Otto Everyone on the homestead was gone, and I can't remember. They were seriously gone. Maybe Otto was on his buffalo trip on the boat or something. I mean, really gone. And oh, yeah. the only person here was Otsley, and he was filming something different. He had the camera guys with him, and he was filming something at his house. And so I 
I went to him because I'm thinking, what the heck do I do? You know, how am I going to just go up to the head of the bay myself and do something with this cow? You know, so Mm -hmm. I I saw Otsley and said, and the camera guys, and I said, you guys, we've got a cow that's stuck and the tide will be coming in. It will definitely die. It's just going to die anyway, being stuck in there. And Otsley and the camera guys just that instant said, we're on it. Get your stuff. We're going with you. And the camera guys wanted to film it, of course. But anyway, sure. Otsley was so awesome. And so um, he has a calmness about him that just was like a can do it calmness. And the camera guys were so awesome. And so we went up there and, and we couldn't, we didn't get it the first day. We had like pulley problems and everything. But then the second day, we hauled up a battery which is so freaking heavy and got the battery up there. I think Shane ended up coming up and he was, he actually carried the battery. And so we were able to, with the battery power, the pulley worked better and we actually got the cow out of that gut. And that very next day, the tide was high enough that it would have drowned that cow. If we hadn't gotten it out then that would have been over. So um, I was so relieved. I was just, I couldn't believe when we actually pulled that cow out of that tidal gut. It was just remarkable. And so wow. I guess for me, that was so rewarding and overwhelming and emotional. And, um, you know, that that it really is my favorite episode because I think I was the most I had the most at stake and the most it was the hardest thing because of how isolated it was and how hard it was to figure out a plan Luckily, Otsley did all the kilt your brain thing about the pulley. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was my favorite episode. Did the episode turn out like the final version, what you had hoped it would be? Yeah, the episode was, um, if I remember right, there's been so many episodes and it's been a while ago, but I felt I was, I felt good about how they, they edited it, how it was presented. It was how it was. <laughs> wow. Well, it really speaks to the community too. You, not only the family, but for people to let you know that your cow is down there too. If I heard your story right, somebody from the community let you know that there was a cow down there stuck. Is that well, how it? Yeah, it was Mark Moret who, yeah. because nobody's really up there except Mark right. Moret or the cowboys. Okay. And so, yeah, it would have some. Sometimes there are hunters up there, sure. but um, mm-hmm. there isn't much uh, human activity up there and so mark is a fellow cattleman and um he watches our herd his herd uh runs with our herd we we have them in the same area of the the head of the bay and so he's up there um often in the summer he's up there even daily and so he keeps a really good eye on things and let us know what was up but and oh yeah so when he called me he had he already had been he got a shovel and he was digging and digging he was trying to dig the cow out of the mud and he was so tired and frustrated and the the it's clay the stuff that the cow was stuck in it's just like solid clay and so he said he just couldn't dig deep enough or or you know dig enough to make any difference because the the um tidal gut was just as narrow as the cow and so you would have to dig so much clay to make it big enough for her to have gotten out and so we were able to hook pulleys under her body get um dig enough to reach under her her chest and stomach and stuff to hook the pulleys around her and pull her out but uh, anyway that was that was just a phenomenal mm-hmm. episode <laughs> what a story Mm -hmm. what a story it reminds me just a little bit of back at bear cove how you do rely on the people that are there and Mm -hmm. you do help each other out even if it's digging at um your neighbor's cow to get them out of the mud giving them a call i know troy and i were in our little dinghy um headed out to one of our neighbors across bear cove and Gone was the uh, plug in the dinghy. We couldn't find it. And so it started to fill up with water. And we made it to the boat at to the Bohemian Queen at the mooring ball and um, recognized that it was filling up with water. 
And so we had to call one of our um, neighbors in the Bay who happened to have an extra plug for a dinghy. And oh um, yeah, but, you know, it's just so remote too, right? Mm-hmm. That that having people um, that you can rely on and um, work with is, it's a blessing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it it's the only way you can operate out here, I think, is to know that you've got some neighbors you can call on in times of need. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And always pay it forward because mm-hmm. um you know that it'll come full circle when you when you're in such a remote location. Well said Roxanne. So speaking of community, you've been in Homer for many years. What are some of your favorite things to do in Homer, Miss Charlotte? Well, I really do love getting out on the water. I feel like the bay is um, such a beautiful feature here in Homer. And um, just getting out on a boat, the Homer Spit, as you guys know, but maybe uh, whoever hasn't been to Homer, the Homer Spit is just such a unique piece of land that just goes about three miles out into the ocean. And so then you've got... um, the mountains um, and the bay right there is just, it, it's just hard to imagine that much beauty all in one place. <laughs> and uh, when I first saw Homer, um, first laid eyes on the place, I just thought, I've never seen a prettier place in my life. And how does a person live here? How do you move to this place? <laughs> I wanted to live there. <laughs> it's just so, so uniquely beautiful. And so I think getting out on the water is um, is one of the coolest things to do around here. And then if you can get um, onto the water and then maybe uh, over across the bay, kayaking in some of the smaller um, lagoons and bays, I actually am not like a, I don't, I'm not that much of a boat person, even though I'm in a family of boats and stuff like that. And so (laughs) Otto's landing crafts, I'm good with. That feels big and sturdy and everything to me. But I am not like, when I'm in a skiff, I'm kind of like a white knuckle person. If there's (laughs) waves and stuff, I'm always just like, oh, I'm going to die. I would never, myself personally, I would not take a kayak from here and kayak across the bay. But I absolutely love it if I'm in the kayak (laughs) already across the bay and going around the little little bays and lagoons. It's so Mm -hmm. beautiful and such a lovely experience. Um, so I feel like the water is something important to get out and enjoy here. And then you see so much wildlife too. And then people who like to fish, of course, you know, get out on the water. And again, I'm not really a fisherman, um, but, um, and then there are also so many nice hiking trails around here. Again, I love some of the ones that are across the bay. One of my favorite is near um, your retreat. You got that glacier lake loop mm-hmm. trail. Yeah, um, the Gruink Glacier. Yeah, that is such a beautiful hike. And it, it's easy enough that I, I feel like most people can hike it. There is that steep that one steep part, <laughs> depending on which way you uh, you start on that loop. Right. Uh, it's nice to sometimes have the steep part be the downhill <laughs> instead of the uphill. <laughs> but um, it's such a beautiful trail. And then just sitting at that lake with the the glacier, um, you know, the icebergs that calve off of the glacier and float around. It's just um, kind of an easy way to get really up close to a glacier and enjoy those ice bergs floating it's just gorgeous so that is actually one of my favorite things whenever i have guests here i usually try to get over there and do that hike with them oh that's great we do too that's one of our favorites as well charlotte without a doubt thank you for sharing lady and i and are kind of like you when uh, back in 2019 it's the first time we had come up to alaska and decided to do a camper road trip of course, we didn't get too far once you realize how big the state of Alaska is. <laughs> it took a <laughs> long time to drive anywhere, but we did hit the the hot spots and the main places. And of course, Homer Spit was one of them. We camped uh, right on the spit and fell in love with it. And here we are, what, five, six years later and have Bear Cove Retreat. So it's, uh, it's been wow. an amazing, uh, beautiful place to be be part of for sure. 
A little side note to that too. When we were building in the first year, we had met Otto for the first time at the East End Saloon. I think you were there too, Charlotte. I think we (laughs) met each other, but Troy and Otto had been talking on the phone because friends in town had given us Otto's number for our build of Bear Cove Retreat. And I just, I love this part of the story. Troy goes, Otto, we have to go say hello. I said, well, of course we do. (laughs) So Troy goes up to Otto, puts out his hand and he says, Otto Kilcher, Troy Janky. And Otto stands up and he slaps his knee and he goes, God damn it, Troy Janky. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing here? It was so precious. And then we got the best picture. I think the three of us were just beaming in the picture. It was a lot of fun. Troy and Otto had a nice little interaction there. It was really fun. And of course that (laughs) night uh, or that afternoon, Jewel was playing at, and then Otsley was, yeah, you remember that maybe. Yeah, it was great. It was a fun night. Yeah, that was a, yeah, concert in that whole, that back yard area yeah, of yes. the Downey Saloon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. fabulous. It's yeah. Very fun. Yes. I really look forward to hanging out with you guys this summer and um showing you my peonies and oh, I want to um hang out at your retreat. It just Wait. is the most beautiful place ever. So um anyway I look forward to some better weather and seeing you guys. <laughs> Yes. Well, we can't thank you enough for joining us on the podcast today. This episode was quite the treat. Lainey? Charlotte, you are everything that Roxanne said and all those adjectives to begin with. You are genuine. (laughs) You are absolutely sweet. You talk and you speak from the heart and we just feel it. And so we're just blessed to have had you um, be here with us today. So thank you so much. Well, thanks. It's been so fun talking to you guys. Thank you. All right. Hope to see you soon. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Well, Lainey and I had so much fun uh, chatting with Charlotte, our guest today on Discovering the Last Frontier. Um, Please join us in future episodes where we'll be interviewing local Homer businesswomen. Thank you all for being here with us, and we'll look forward to seeing you real soon.